an island haunted by an evil djinn, hybrid monsters hunting from the trees, and something raking its claws along the walls of people's homes at night. These stories make up episodes 20 and 21 of Outdoor Terrors, a podcast I host dedicated to horror stories that happened in the great outdoors. Look for it and leave a rating on Spotify and Apple, and if you've got an outdoor horror story of your own, send it to me at darkstories.org. Or check out my other stuff at eeriecast.com. Now, throw a log on the fire, because the night is still young. The following story is a pretty creepy one for me. It reminds me of the cloaked figure phenomenon, which I've been hearing a lot about and might be connected to missing person cases. What a terrifying thought that the people in this story might have narrowly avoided being disappeared. Something in the Woods From Something Eerie, 26 I'm a 20-year-old college student who's in ROTC. My program has all contracted cadets shuttled out to a local military base every semester for an FTX, which is a field training exercise. I'll be leaving the specific base anonymous. In March of 2023, two of my friends went on this trip. The only reason I didn't go was because I wasn't yet contracted. Typically, the trip lasts four days, and the base is around four hours away. When my friends returned, they told us what happened during the trip. During the night land nav iteration, cadets get sent out with a compass and a map to find points given to them. My friends did this too, and they experienced something spine-chilling. They heard something rustling in the surrounding woods as they stepped into the pitch-black darkness. As they moved along the thin path, this unknown thing followed them. They shined their headlamps toward the general direction of the sounds, but they never saw anything. After about ten minutes, the sounds kept pursuing them. They decided they'd had enough and turned back to the starting point. When they returned, they told people about the experience, but no one believed them. The story sounded believable to me, but I never gave it a thought that it could happen to me. Until November of 2023. It was time for the fall semester FTX. I was now contracted at this point, so I was required to go. After loading onto the bus, we made our way into the military base. My friends and I were having the best time the whole way there. Our commissioning class is really close, almost like a second family. When we arrived, we unloaded our equipment and entered our barracks. These barracks weren't the newest or nicest, but I was happy to just be sleeping on a mattress instead of the dirt. We all prepared for the next 48 hours ahead of us, which consisted of being shuttled out to a land nav course, sleeping in a patrol base that night, then having a full day of lanes the following day. My friends and I stayed up in the barracks, all squished together in a bunk, laughing and telling stories. We stayed up until around 1am, which we would definitely regret the next day. The wake-up time was 5am, which wasn't actually bad compared to the 4am wake-up time we had the day after. We woke up that morning and got shuttled out to the land nav site. We took a quick test, then, since I'm a second year, got paired up to begin our full day of land nav. I paired up with one of my friends, she and I knocked out our points and returned to the starting point for Chow. Now, we couldn't really cheat, because our instructors took our phones, to guarantee that we didn't cheat. After everyone else got back, we ate our MREs and got sent out for our second land nav iteration. Yet again, she and I did really well and found three out of the four points, and again we got back and waited for everyone else to return. Our instructor surprised us with hot chow from the DFAC. As the light seeped from the sky, you could hear packs of coyotes in the distance howling. To be honest, coyotes always freaked me out. 
It wasn't their sighs, but the sounds they made. The way they kind of howled and hollered and had conversations with each other. After that, our instructors gave us new coordinates to plot on our maps. By now, it was pitch black. This time, we had to switch partners. For the sake of the story, I'll call her M. M and I were given our usual safety brief, consisting of do not interact with wildlife and only turn your red lamps on when you're checking your map or azimuth. She and I then set out. We were excited since most of our points were along this more significant path, and we didn't have to go too deep in the woods. As we started our journey to the first point, we talked, our eyes adjusting to the dimly lit path. The trees blocked most of the little moonlight we had. We weren't on the path long before we began hearing rustling sounds in the woods on our left. I looked at him, wide-eyed and whispering. Did you hear that? She shook her head, but we both agreed it was just some deer off in the distance. We started to talk louder, trying to scare off our new follower, and kept walking. Soon, the rustling stopped, and we just carried on. But then, much louder and more aggressive rustling started to the right of us, not even a minute later. It sounded like it was only 15 feet away. My heart sank. M looked at me with a worried expression on her face. There wasn't a need to verbally confirm the noise, because with the looks on our faces, we both knew the other person out there had heard the same thing. We didn't want to be overdramatic, so we kept walking, slowly. We talked even louder to ensure that if it was a deer, it would likely run off when it hurt us. But our loud talking didn't work. The rustling turned into loud, stalking footsteps. It sounded like leaves crunching with loud thuds. It grew closer and closer to the path that we were on. Now, earlier I said it was 15 feet away, but now it had to be between 5 and 10 feet. It followed us for about 10 more yards. We briefly broke the rules, shining our headlamps into the brush. We saw nothing. No outline of a figure. No glowing eyes. Nothing. All that we could hear were these loud thuds that continued to follow us. This creeped us out because there would have been glowing eyes if it were an animal. We started walking back to back, keeping our headlamps on to cover our fronts and backs. Again, it kept following us along the pathway. As our situation started to be more serious, we needed to figure out if whatever this was, was truly stalking us. I stayed in place, shining my light into the brush while M went ahead and walked slowly. I heard that thing following her now. I caught back up to her, telling her that I heard the loud thuds that followed as she went ahead. This final thing freaked both of us out, and we had to make a decision. We decided that we needed to go back to the starting point. So we began to speed walk back, but it didn't take long before it turned into a run. I know that sounds like a bad idea, but our flight or fight responses kicked in at that point. We ran as fast as we could down the path. We could hear that thing stalking us, now starting to run in the brush beside us. It was fast. We picked up the pace, seeing two figures in the distance. Em and I were terribly relieved when the two figures turned out to be two friends of ours, Luke and Brian. They yelled at us, you two better slow down. We thought you were a car with those headlamps on. We cut them off, filling them in on what happened. They laughed and shrugged it off. It was probably just a coyote or a deer. Nothing to be freaked out about. Tell you what, we were going to go the way you two just came from. So now me and Brian can go back with you. If we hear it, we'll scare it off. Then go on our own ways to our points. Em and I agreed to the offer. We were probably just paranoid, like Luke said, right? We walked and talked to them about other things, trying to keep our minds off the fear. 
When we got to the spot where we first heard the rustling, we told them. Within seconds, the same leaves began to crunch with loud thuds. Both Luke and Brian froze. They looked at us and immediately said, Nope, let's go. The four of us swiftly sped and walked back to the start point area. I remember saying, I told you me and him weren't being dramatic. Brian responded, Next time one of y'all say something like that, we'll believe you. Personally, I just wanted to be done. But if we'd gone back to the starting point with our instructors, they would not be very thrilled that we found none of our points, and there were two more hours left in our time hack. So the four of us stuck together. We went to another side of the map to find our points. We were paranoid, all keeping our headlamps on at a low setting so no one would catch us. Unfortunately, Luke and Brian found their point before ours, so they had to go back to the starting point. But luckily, we found another person to tag along with us, so we wouldn't be alone. We all chatted and tried to lighten up our spirits, but this new friend's point was before ours too, so he had to peel off in a different direction. Alone, Em and I chugged along to find our final point. It was so deep in the woods that we had to file through the brush. But we finally found it. Yet again, we were relieved, because now we could go back to the start and get this over with. The whole time, it felt as though something was watching us. I was constantly looking over my shoulders, jumping at every little thing. Em and I tried to keep a conversation going to keep our spirits up, but I could feel the tension surrounding us. The forest that was around us was so silent, you could probably hear a pin drop. I knew that the forest being quiet was never a very good sign. We were around halfway back when we started to hear the same crunching and thuds coming from our right. This time, I froze in fear. I couldn't believe it was happening again. I'm not super religious, but in that moment, I started to pray to whatever or whoever was listening. M turned around, and we put our backs together. We started to walk a little faster in the deep, dark woods. It's very rare for me to lose my cool, but I had a very uneasy feeling, and I was starting to freak out. M reassured me that I needed to keep a level head. If it wasn't for her, I think I would have broke down. We finally got to a dirt path and heard, What are y'all doing with your lamps on? This came from an upperclassman. We explained to her what happened, and she explained that the exact same thing happened to her and some other people too. I told them how that was weird, that the noise was so loud and clear, but there were no glowing eyes. No figures. Seemingly no other physical presence. They claimed that's exactly what happened to them. When we all got back, there were multiple groups who experienced this. One person was even surrounded by a pack of coyotes. Luckily, no one was hurt. But we would be lying if we said we weren't paranoid to sleep out there that night. There is something out there that's apparently not scared to stand up to a large group of people. Be careful, and use your common sense. My Grandparents' Weird Property From Straw Hat Number 12 This all started when I was about 10 years old. I grew up in southern Wisconsin, but I moved out of state when I turned 20. My paternal grandparents immigrated from Laos to America in 1975, and may God rest my grandfather's soul. They got a house outside a small town with a little bit of acreage. They had this insanely huge garden in the backyard, with every vegetable and herb you can think of, accompanied by a huge chicken coop with various species of birds and other animals. They always attended farmers' markets to give back to the community, but the land always felt a bit odd to me. The tree line behind the huge garden had a trail in the bit of woods behind the house, 
that led from one side of the yard to the other. It was about a 10 to 15 minute walk through the small patch of woods, which was surrounded by farmland. I remember my uncle, who's only a few years older than me, taking me on a go-kart ride through there before, and he would just gun it through at full speed. Well, on this occasion, my 10-year-old self was alone. I decided to walk alone on that trail for the first time. I remember how the sun hit the trees and leaves, the softest breeze I ever experienced. It was like something out of a Studio Ghibli film. It was beautiful. I noticed I was getting tired, feeling like I was walking for a long time. But then, out of nowhere, I felt this paranoia, like I wasn't alone anymore. It was a fear I'd never experienced. I knew something was close to me, something that wasn't good. I could hear it walking around and the twigs breaking underfoot, but coming from many directions at once, that feeling of being watched. I kept looking about, feeling confused and not seeing anything. I was panicking at this point. This all hit me in an instant, just slapping me to reality. All of a sudden, I felt somebody, not something, but somebody next to me. And that feeling was comforting and reassuring. I looked up to my right, smiling, as if to say thank you to someone. But I didn't see anyone. I kept on walking with my head down, knowing that I had to get out of the woods. After a few minutes, I began to hear shouting. I looked up, and I saw I was finally at the other side of the backyard where the trail ended. I stepped into the yard, and I looked back, waving goodbye at nothing but air. My aunt was on the back deck, yelling out for me, asking where I was. I wondered what she meant, as I could have only been gone for a few minutes. But she said I'd been gone for four hours. Now remember me saying that the walking trail was only about a 10-15 to 15 minute walk. I'd lost four hours. I remember looking at the time, and sure enough, she was right. I walked into the house, and everyone was gathered there, looking at me like, what the heck, kid? I was so lost. I felt mad, too. Mad that I didn't know what happened. Mad that I couldn't piece together anything, because nothing made sense. Since that day, I haven't felt right, and I never walked that trail again. In 2014, my family put a trail cam up in the backyard, and they caught a photo of what they believed to be two spirits holding hands. I will link to this photo in the description. Wisconsin is known for Native American folklore. The whole state seems to be practically haunted. Fast forward to my dad's 38th birthday in December at the same house. I was standing next to the kitchen counter. I was just looking down at the floor when suddenly, everything around me began to move and fast forward. Imagine fast forwarding a VHS tape. Imagine how that looked. Yeah, except I wasn't moving. I was paralyzed, stuck staring down at the darn floor. My dad was sitting on the couch next to the counter, and all of a sudden, I was able to move after what felt like five minutes of trying to force myself to. The first thing I did was look up from where I was standing and ask him, How old are you today? I'm turning 39, he replied, looking at me confused, with a mix of concern. I looked at the calendar and did my math to make sure he wasn't pulling my leg. Thinking to myself, a whole year? A whole year went by? I'd lost an entire year? I couldn't help but think this was related to the four hours I lost during that trail incident. I went to the bathroom to gather myself, and I noticed the shirt I was wearing was small and tight. I was shocked. My stomach was even showing at the bottom. My dad had to help me find a shirt that fit. I don't remember school or any activities or anything from that missing year. I held on to that shirt for a few years afterwards, after all, it was connected to that mystery. This has weighed heavily on my mind for a long time. 
I've spent years researching about time, the woods, etc., looking up other people's similar experiences to assure myself that I'm not crazy. I've never told anyone of these experiences because I understand what it sounds like. I get it. People don't care until it happens to them. The Island Jin from Tia Bini. I had a friend in college named E, who was from a beautiful island, which I'll keep anonymous here. To give you some idea, though, these are a cluster of several islands, some of which are uninhabited. Of the uninhabited islands, only a few places are accessible to the general public, as there are several tribes living there, too. So, to protect their liberty and to let them live in peace, the government has strict regulations in place. E once invited me to spend Diwali with her family. She lived in a lovely coastal town, brimming with history and stories. I was to spend about ten days with E's family, and I was super excited. Her house had a rustic charm to it, with wooden pillars and old architectural designs. Inside, I was surprised to find horseshoes nailed on the wall. There was one horseshoe in every room of the house, including the bathrooms and the kitchen. This was a bit odd, as it didn't really seem to be part of the decor. When I asked her about it, E told me a tale that was creepy and a bit unsettling. When E's aunt, who we'll call S, was young, she had a certain health condition that seemed to not go away. Her parents had taken her to several doctors and hospitals, but nothing had ever worked out. Finding no other solution, they decided to consult a spiritual healer. This spiritual healer was an old man who supposedly had entrapped a djinn. The djinn would tell him answers that people needed to know, and he had gained quite a reputation for himself for helping people out. So when S's parents, E's grandparents, went to see him, they weren't sure what to expect. They saw the old man go into some kind of trance, wheezing and shaking violently. He made loud grunts and carried an unintelligible conversation with someone or something, presumably the djinn. He even had a whip with him that he used on himself once or twice, which was quite scary for S's parents. But soon he came out of this trance and gave them the name of a doctor, the name of the hospital they were associated with, and the place the hospital was located. He told them to take S there, and everything should be fine. Shockingly, the details he had provided were right to the T. This hospital and the doctor were in another part of the country, and there's no way he could have had that information. Even if he did know, by some fluke, when S and her parents went there, they were able to address her health issue once and for all. After that... S went on to live a normal life, with her condition gone. When I heard about this, I didn't know what to make of it. I reasoned with it, thinking S's parents had perhaps found the doctor on their own, and somehow convinced themselves it was thanks to the healer. But this was in the 60s, way before the internet. There's no way they could have known about a doctor living thousands of kilometers away in a town they didn't even know existed, he assured me. I shrugged, asking her to go on. The old man, who had been the djinn's medium or master, died some time later of natural causes. But upon his death, weird things started to happen all around the place. People reported seeing a luminescent figure hovering in the woods late at night, watching them from the dark. Sometimes on desolate trails, people reported hearing laughter from the trees, a deep and sinister laughter. At one point, a tribal man was found on a bustling street in the city, frantic and having no recollection of how he'd even got there. Tribes keep to themselves, and the areas they live in are well protected to not disturb them. So for one of them to just wander into the city without warning was next to impossible. A few government officials had later come in and restrained him, as he was quite erratic. 
Linguists were called in to translate what he was saying, and he claimed that he had been following a pulsating light through the jungle. Before he knew it, before he could even make sense of what was going on, he woke up here. The officials made sure he was back safe with his community, but the people around now truly believe it was the djinn's doing, and that the djinn now haunted the surrounding wilderness. They say when the old man died, the djinn's master, this djinn was no longer tethered. That would explain the laughter, the glowing sights, and everything else. Perhaps this was a playful djinn, he said. But her family did not want to take any chances, playful djinn or otherwise. Horseshoes and houses apparently keep djinns away, preventing them from coming inside. And even to this day, any new house built on the island comes with a set of horseshoes nailed in the corner, one for every room of the house. As for the djinn, maybe it's still lurking out there, until someone else traps it. Elephants in the Cemetery From Moon Cloud 5733 this took place in the mid-1990s, in the cemetery where my grandparents, great-grandparents, great-aunt, and great-uncle were buried. A part of this cemetery is known as Showman's Rest. The plot was bought by the Showman's League of America, a sort of union for carnival and circus workers. The union's first president was Buffalo Bill Cody. The plot was bought to bury members who had no money or family to pay for funeral services. In 1918, the nation had long into its involvement in the First World War. Trains ferried troops to the East Coast from training camps to be sent to France. One such train was being driven by a man who had been making these runs for days. Exhausted, he fell asleep at the controls. Outside of Hammond, Indiana, a train from the Hagenbeck Wallace Circus was stopped due to mechanical issues. The empty troop train crashed into the circus train, carrying performers, and in some cases, their families. Many of those trapped in the wreckage died in the ensuing fire. In 1918, the means to identify bodies was not as advanced as today. Within Showman's Rest, there are over 100 graves, their markers simply reading, Unknown Male Number 33, or Unknown Female Number 4 or worst of all, unknown child. All with the date, June 22, 1918. I first learned of this area after my grandmother's funeral in 1984. My father saw the stone statues of elephants that marked the four corners of the plot, and was curious. Even as a child, the sadness of these graves touched me. Over the years, my curiosity grew, and I researched the site. Not as easy in the time before the internet. Though now you can find details of the Hagenbeck Wallace circus train accident with a quick Google search. Based on the statues in the cemetery, I believe, and rumors abound, that circus elephants haunt the graves. A friend of mine in high school swore up and down he'd heard elephants there once. So, being teenagers, we decided to go one night. I kept trying to tell them all the animals had been on a different train, but my friend insisted. So we went. At that time of night, traffic was at a low ebb. We were about 35 minutes. Getting there wasn't much of a problem. We were there for about 35 minutes, and all of us were very, very uneasy. It just felt wrong being in that cemetery. I had this distinct feeling our rowdy teenage nonsense was not welcome here. To the surprise of many of us, we did indeed hear something. Animal sounds. Three of my friends bolted right then and right there, one running face first into a tree. What didn't occur to them then was the fact that there was a zoo not too far from there, so animal sounds like that were not an uncommon occurrence. Besides, we were outside. Where else would animals be? After calming everyone down and making sure my one friend had not broken his nose, I suggested we apologize for making a scene. That feeling of disapproval had grown stronger. It didn't feel hostile, just a sense we didn't belong here right now, 
and that we should go. I never told them at the time, not wanting to feel further late-night trips after the feelings I had. But as we left, I did turn back. A street light illuminated the area, specifically where the low shrubs bordered Showman's Rest, abutting one of the statues. Standing just before the hedges, one hand resting on the statue, was a boy who appeared to be about 10 or 11 years old, based on his size. He was dressed in a style I would associate with the World War I era. Knickerbocker-style pants, high socks, suspenders, and a sort of gray cap on his head. The left side of his face and the hand resting on the statue seemed to be horribly burned, and he almost seemed to be smiling. He raised his right hand, and he waved at me. At that moment, I heard sirens and a fire truck passing by, followed by an ambulance. The boy turned and seemed very excited by them, and then he was gone. I hurried to catch up with my friends. That weekend, I went to put flowers on my grandparents' graves. When I left, I stopped by Showman's Rest. I walked to the heartbreaking line of graves of the accident victims until I reached one of the unknown child graves. It just felt right, like that was the one. From my pocket, I took out a Hot Wheels fire truck, which I had stopped and bought along the way, and placed it on the grave. As I left, I turned back, and I swear that truck was gone. No one else was in the area, and there was no wind. Ever since that day, I felt a sense of welcome when I visit. Twice more I've seen that boy, once on his own pushing the truck along the base of one of the elephant statues, and once standing with a woman, herself terribly burned and holding her hand. I quickly left. I can't describe it, but the moment felt private, like standing and gawking would have been wrong and a sort of betrayal of trust. I've been back numerous times over the years, and I always get that feeling. A feeling sort of like acceptance and welcome, as if my show of respect earned some sort of trust. I've never brought anyone but my own family, and I never gave anyone else details of what I see and feel. I felt that doing so would be a betrayal of that sense of trust. While I have not given any names or directions, the location is very easy to find. But please, if you visit, honor their rest and be respectful. If you see a lonely little boy with a toy fire truck, just give him a wave and let him know someone remembers. I only caught a glimpse from Jules. I was living with my boyfriend. I'll call him D for this story. His family lives in a small rural town surrounded by woods in central Alberta. I'm originally from a big city in Ontario, but I spent my summers camping and had never had an experience quite like this in all my time in the woods. It wasn't too late at night when we decided to head outside for a smoke. I think it was around 9.30 or 10 p.m. at the latest. Dee and I snuck out of our room quietly, so as to not disturb the sleeping kids or their mother. We let the dog out, making sure the door was secure, before we made our way to the shed where we liked to hang out while smoking. It gave us a bit of privacy. I noticed a strange feeling in the atmosphere, but I brushed it off. We lived in a shady town, and things often felt off like that. We were just chilling in the shed, chatting about whatever stupid topic we had in mind, when I realized just how still and quiet it had gotten. Now, keep in mind, there was a distant but close enough highway that you could always hear it outside. But for some reason, that was silent too. This made me uneasy, so I told Dee to be quiet for a moment, so we could listen. As soon as the two of us shut up, we heard three consistent tapping sounds coming from the window to my left. This sounded like someone was drumming their fingers on the glass. My heart sank. At first, I thought I was just hearing things. I am schizophrenic, and my mind has a tendency to play tricks on me. 
but as Dee and I both stared at each other, wide-eyed, I knew it was real. We sat in silence for a moment, analyzing, straining our ears to pick up any sound from outside. But there was nothing. It was silent. We couldn't even hear the dog roaming around the small yard. And as I had a background in witchcraft and have always loved anything scary, everything I'd ever heard about skinwalkers began to flood into my mind. I was scared. Suddenly, something started banging aggressively against the side of the shed under the window, and we had initially thought it was the dog. But it was harsh. I could tell it was something large and fleshy hitting the metal siding. It wasn't a clang or anything like that, and it wasn't the soft thunk the dog made when she jumped on the bed. It was like somebody was slamming their hand or fist against the wall. Immediately, we decided we'd had enough. We started to pack up our stuff to head back inside. I put the chair away, and as I waited for Dee to finish up, I leaned against the door, which doesn't properly latch, as it was missing the metal piece that goes on the frame which also happened to be splintered and broken. Whatever was banging on the wall had had enough too, and it fell silent for a short moment. It startled me when it slammed into the door behind me. I felt the impact through the cold metal. I felt the door budge just a little bit under my weight, and as the sound of the thuds ended, something was being dragged across the door, something sharp. I could feel it, just like the impact, I knew there was more than one point of contact. There was more than one thing dragging across the door. Likely a hand. Likely clawed. And equally likely, attached to something that could and wanted to kill us. I could almost smell the evil in the air. And as I felt the door opening more and more with every thud, I feared for my life. I did not think we were going to get out of that shed alive then it stopped. Just like that, the banging stopped, and as I heard the familiar sounds of the dog running up to the shed, I could hear footsteps retreating. When I felt safe, I peeled myself away from the door, my legs shaking as I slowly opened it just enough to see out of and look around. The dog was there, sniffing the ground and pacing about. She seemed stressed, and I couldn't really blame her, I had nearly soiled my pants myself. We left quickly, calling the dog and running into the house. As we crossed the porch and shoved the door open, something on the roof moved in the corner of my eye. I looked over as whatever was up there ducked out of my view. I only caught a glimpse, but I could tell it looked vaguely human. Vaguely. I've done some digging since that night looking for explanations, and I learned that the only native reserve was more than an hour away. Dee isn't really into folklore or superstitions, so we spent a lot of time trying to come up with a rational explanation of what had happened, even going as far as to bring the dog outside to see if her paws could reach the window of the shed, which she couldn't. There was at least a foot between her paws and the window, that still wouldn't have explained the strange pattern of noises we heard, nor the human figure on the roof. I've had several strange dreams about that house, about those woods. Nightmares about malicious creatures chasing me, hunting me down, tearing off my flesh. We haven't heard anything since. It might have had something to do with the fact I've been carrying sage and crystals around, or maybe whatever we had smoked cause us to share a hallucination, which I don't think that's possible. Whatever it is, I'll never know, but I sure don't ever want to go walking in the woods behind the house again. At least, not alone. The Skeleton From A Random Wendigo I live in a small town in the U.S. It has a trail on the north end, this happened over the summer. I don't remember the day or month, but I do remember what happened quite clearly. I was with one of my best friends, E. That day was especially hot, and E had come over to my house. 
I let my sister know I was going to take off and hang out with E for a while. I asked him where he wanted to go. To the trail, he replied. So we talked as usual, making our way to the trail. We arrived about 15 minutes later. We started to discuss clearings in these woods that were off the trail, and I showed him one of them. We kept on going towards a bridge, and we crossed over. There was a little stream there, which flowed into a creek. After that, we spotted this big tree standing over a clearing. The way it was gnarled and twisted made it look like a cave more than a tree. So we went over to check it out. We hung out there for a while before moving on. It was after that when we spotted it. Dude, look, he said. We walked over to a smaller clearing. There, we saw this deer skeleton lying on the ground. Some of the bones were in different areas than the rest. If we had to guess, it looked to have been there for about a year, but some of its bones were shattered like glass. Definitely looked like something had been feasting on it for a while. Leaving the remains right here. What do you think killed it? He said. I don't know. I guess something strong enough to shatter bones like glass. We left soon after that, calling it a day. But we did come back the next day, as we wanted to see this skeleton again. But when we got back to the clearing, it was gone. Like something had cleaned it up, despite the remains being left there for so long. Very weird. I didn't really know what to say about this. That's when we heard this noise up in the trees. You might be thinking it was a bird, but I soon noticed it sounded too heavy. Then, just as the two of us went quiet after discussing for a moment, something fell to the ground behind us. I turned around like anyone would, and I saw it. The skull of the deer, just lying there on the ground. Was that there when we got here? I asked. No, he replied. We knew we weren't alone then. There was something in the trees above us. We started running out of there, just as something leaped out of the trees behind us. In a mad panic, we climbed over fallen trees, trying to make our escape, when E fell, hitting his head hard. I turned around, and I saw something I'll never forget. It was mostly white, covered in bone, standing about seven feet tall, with eyes blacker than coal. The skin looked like a bunch of animal skins all stitched together. It had long, dangly arms with long claws. It looked like it had barely any muscle, but it seemed to break tree branches with ease. What I saw was slouching and lumbering its way towards E. I ran over to him, picked him up, and ran as quickly as I could. I was so afraid it was going to catch up to us. We crossed over the stream, and suddenly... The sound of it chasing us stopped. The two of us ran as quickly as we could, never coming back to that trail again. Dogman or Skinwalker in North Georgia From Morris I'm a 28-year-old guy with a family of four and a pretty good job. The paranormal has followed me and my immediate family for the better part of two decades. I grew up in a house that could rival the Conjuring house. But that's all a different story. This is about a certain creature. The first time I encountered this creature, I was hiking with my brother and my now wife down some trails behind the house. We were getting tired, but decided to go a bit further. This would soon prove to be a mistake. We made it to this dome-like area, which we realized was completely constructed by woven trees. When we stepped inside, my girl said she wouldn't come in. When I tried to convince her that it was fine, all the sounds around us were turned off like a light switch, all at once. I took a look around, and I noticed what looked to be a hand placed on the trunk of a nearby tree. It looked like a raccoon's hand, only twice the size of a human's, with long claws that looked like they could tear through metal. I don't know where this courage came from, but I took two steps towards it. To this day, I wish I hadn't. 
looking down on me was the most horrific sight I ever witnessed. Upside down, as if it were crawling down the tree, was what I could only describe as a werewolf looking me dead in the face. If it were standing up, I'd say it would have been six feet tall. Its fur, unlike other dogman encounters I've ever heard, was clean, long, and black. Its eyes were a fiery ember yellow and gold, with a stare that burned into my very soul. It pulled its hand back, taking a step backwards back up the tree. At that moment, I was able to move again, and my brother, who was standing right behind me, looked at me in complete disbelief and terror. I told him to just calmly walk backwards, back to the trail. But then, we started to hear cracks in the branches, and we couldn't take it. We booked it. The last time I have seen a creature similar was when me and my brother and his girlfriend were riding on a back road late at night, smoking. I know what you're thinking, but my brother's girlfriend doesn't even smoke and was completely sober during the whole thing, and even she can't explain it. As we turned on the gravel pass, things were deftly quiet. No more than 30 seconds later, something the size of a grizzly bear ran across the road at breakneck speed. We saw it stop on the other side of the road, so we stopped for a moment to get a better look. After all, we felt safe inside the car. What we saw would be burned into our minds for the rest of our lives. At first, we thought we'd hit it, because its limbs were turning and popping as if the bones were breaking. It wasn't until I saw what appeared to be red patchy fur over the top of human-looking skin that I gasped. It looked directly at us, ears perked up like a German shepherd, eyes glowing a fiery orange with no source of light for eyeshine. We were only 20 feet from this thing, and I saw its lips curl back, bearing teeth, drool dripping from its maw. At that point, I broke from my trance and screamed at my brother to floor it. He was just stuck staring at the thing. Right as I thought it was going to come to make us the first meal of the night, my screams finally got through to my brother, and he gunned it. I don't think it followed us, but I couldn't stop myself from looking out the rearview mirror the rest of the way home. We discussed what it could have been. Dog man, werewolf, skinwalker maybe? We couldn't really come to a conclusion. All we know is that it radiated fear and evil. Just be careful on the back roads of northern Georgia. There's something out there. Strange Creature in the Pennsylvania Airsoft Fields From Jay Fazlett in the summer of 2016, I was part of a large week-long airsoft event. I was one of 15,000 airsofters who came out to be in this event, and I was part of the 552nd Infantry Battalion Condor Company 3 Squad. Specifically, I was in Fireteam Bravo, with the rank of Specialist. It was day two. My squad was holding a bridgehead 2.5 clicks from Division HQ, with one squad from Tango Company. We dug in, three fighting holes on each side of the road, before and after a bridge. My squad leader had put our belt fed in the innermost fighting hole, and the squad lead from the other squad had put their belt fed on the other side of the bridge. It was getting late. I was feasting on an MRE when one of the guys on watch yelled out, Contact! Left side! 20 meters out! Then all heck broke loose. The 240 in the innermost hole let off bursts of tin BBs until the gun was dry. One of the guys fired a 40mm BB grenade from the 203 on his rifle. I jumped up from under the makeshift shelter in the hole. I started to engage with what I thought was a 6 foot tall hostel, carrying either a bulky shotgun or SAW, wearing a ghillie suit. I only realized that I was in fact not shooting a man with my rifle, but a seven-foot-tall creature of some sort. And I kid you not, the thing reminded me of a Sasquatch or a skunk ape, 
and it wasn't holding a gun. It was carrying a tree branch. The thing went crashing through the trees and brambles, running down into the four-foot-deep, recently flooded river, which had swept away someone earlier that day. It walked up near the vertical three-foot embankment on the other side, hauling tail into the woods on the far side of the road, towards Division HQ. One of the guys from one squad had his deer rifle chambered in 3030 because there was a real coyote problem in the area, and I had a gun chambered in 44 Magnum in my assault rock for the same reason. I immediately pulled out my hand cannon, and I jumped out of the hole. As I did this, the other guy was digging in the tool case on the side of the Humvee to get his rifle because he'd put it in the back of the tool case in a soft case. I saw this and waited because I didn't want to go hunt an angry, teed-off Bigfoot in the woods by myself. The other guy finally got to me. We went into the woods together, but we couldn't find it. We never did see the thing again after that encounter, and my squad was forever known after that as Sasquatch Hunters. The Face I Saw With My Son From Anonymous it was the first day of August, and bear season had started in Oregon. My son and I had gone to the White River Wildlife Area to hunt bears in the afternoon. We put some bear bait on the ground to lure a bear in close and try to get a good shot. My son and I sat about 50 meters away. I was looking somewhere else when I saw my son pick up his rifle. He had the rifle up for three minutes, then just stared at me. Then he stood up, came over to me, and told me what he saw. He said he saw this guy looking at him with a telescope, and that this guy went through a tree when he walked away. Like always, I thought he would be lying, but his face was different than usual, so I took him with me to a different place. It was around 8pm at the time, when he told me, let's go home. I'm tired and scared. So we packed everything up and started walking back to the car. As my son and I walked, I saw something pop out of a tree. But I kid you not, it was a red face with a white mustache. When my son saw it, he gasped and fell backward. I helped him up and asked, Is that what you saw? He replied, That's the guy, the one that went through the tree. When he said that, I grabbed my rifle and aimed at the guy. Obviously, there was nothing normal about this situation, but when I tried to pull the trigger, nothing happened. I pulled it a dozen times, and the rifle didn't fire. I began to yell at the man, and whatever this thing or spirit was came out of the tree and flew out into the canyon. After it was gone, my son and I started going back to the car, We'd left the car four minutes away, but we took longer than four minutes. It took us about 30 minutes walking until we got to the place where we left it. But it wasn't there. My son and I started walking down the road for three miles until we found the car. We had no idea why it was here, but we just wanted to go home. We put the rifles in the car, pushed the gas, and left that place as fast as we could. We got home and went to sleep pretty quick. It was already about 11pm, so we were dog-tired and scared. The Late Night Ghost I Was Not Supposed to See From Anonymous This is a story of an encounter I had whilst with my boyfriend a few years back. We were at his house at the time. Behind the house are some developed areas, but it's still a very small town. Near the house is a forested area, one of those creepy stereotypical ones, with jagged trees that don't curve at any point. They just sort of bend at sharp angles and points at all the branches. Also, they were all mostly bare, a few leaves if any, and the bark was dark in color. There was an old wooden shack there as well, far abandoned, and it had this deep eerie trench dug under it that had a very negative energy to it. It reeked of death. 
There was a sort of hallway in it, but it was a ramp, all made from dirt, like it had just been carved out of the earth. One day, this shack collapsed, but during the time of this story, if I recall correctly, it was still there. The house itself was old, one of the oldest in town, and they were renovating it to sell one day. I was best friends with his sister, so I was supposed to be staying the night with her, but everyone knew I wanted to spend time with my boyfriend. Besides, our friendship had grown apart as we got older, for various reasons, my relationship with her brother likely being one of them. She would get jealous, and for this reason she wasn't with us. She was angry with me for ignoring her. However, she'd been a bad friend to me, so I didn't feel bad about that. He and I were on the couch watching TV. We decided we wanted to take a cigarette break. We went outside, toward the left side of the house. The side I refer to as the normal one, though we usually preferred that forest. It was special to us. But we were tired. It was late, probably 3 a.m. We were in sweats and not about to walk through the sharp debris and trees of the woods. On the side of the house, there was this concrete slab, a sort of stair leading up to the side door of the garage, and we were sitting there facing the trees. He'd brought a large axe with him just in case. It was after dark, and there were tons of coyotes out hunting. And there had been what we believed to be possible paranormal instances. We both knew that there were sometimes some things lurking about the old property. Suddenly, I realized we were both fixated on the same thing. I'm not sure who noticed it first, but when I realized he was looking too, I knew I wasn't crazy. You see that too? I began, hesitantly. You see it? He asked, seemingly surprised. I guess he hadn't noticed me looking at it yet. A pair of eyes, I said. Yeah, he mumbled. It looked like a pair of car headlights almost, the spacing and color, but they were too blue and just light that was eye-shaped, if that makes sense. I would have thought it was a car in the distance, but for it to possibly be in the background I was looking at, headlights would be way too dim to see this clearly. And beyond that, there was no car attached. It was just some eyes. It was close to the turn in the road, but on the property by a large tree. It began to move a little closer. Meanwhile, my boyfriend stood up, putting his arm in front of me momentarily as the universal stay back signal. Be careful, I said, worried. With the axe over his shoulder, he began to walk towards it slowly, and it moved a little closer in response. He barked at it like a dog, like a big dog, it would have been convincing if I hadn't seen it come from his mouth. Then the eyes turned red. My eyes widened as he relaxed and walked back. I was still staring at it. It's still there, I mumbled. But he couldn't see it anymore. To him, it had just faded out. But I was still looking at it. And by now he was looking back too, trying to see it again. It moved forward then revealed itself. It was so stereotypical, to the point it probably sounded like I'd made it up to anyone else, but he knew it was real. It makes you think. Stereotypes have to come from somewhere, right? What I saw was a dark, gray, battered, and hooded cloak. Its eyes still burned red. Whatever it was, it was angry. It emitted this aura-like light all over, a greenish and yellow color. It sounds silly since yellow is part of what makes up green, so wouldn't it be a lighter green or something? My apologies, but I can't describe it in any way that does it justice. It quickly lurched forward, then stopped suddenly as I held intense eye contact with it. Then seemingly hesitantly, it moved to the right, my right, and I followed it with my gaze. It then moved left, then forward, now zigzagging coming towards me. I just continued following the eyes. It's getting closer, I said. It felt like it was testing me, as though it didn't expect me to be able to see it anymore. 
It zigzagged back again towards the big tree and then faded away. It still freaks me out to wonder what it might have been, what it might have had planned had I not been able to see it. I've learned some people can just see spirits better than others, and some can even talk to them, or so I've heard. What might have happened if I couldn't see it, or if I had turned my back to go inside? And why did it seem to care so much that I could see it? What was I going to do, call the police? I don't think I'll ever have answers to these questions. Thanks for stopping by our little campsite here at Outdoor Terrors. To hear your story on the show, send it to us at darkstories.org. For more scary stories from me, catch me on my other podcasts, Unexplained Encounters, and Tales from the Break Room on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. Or go to eeriecast.com for those and even more terrifying podcasts. Follow me on X or Twitter at Dark Prevails. And if you don't mind, leave a rating for Outdoor Terrors on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Till next time, I'll see you soon when the campfire blazes once again.